All right, before the fire, you got to learn to make it. So I'm going to go over slab building techniques in this video. I'm Professor Stephen Robinson. I'm going to discuss wet slab techniques in this video. Tube techniques are some that I'm going to show, along with some freehand ideas. Everything that you're going to do is additive, subtractive, and in clay, it's also expansive. So here we go. I'm going to go over the basics of rolling out a slab using a simple rolling pin. And I asked you to purchase rolling pins uh, sometimes. And in this particular course, you're going to use these boards. I asked you to get some boards too. A nice board that's smooth like this would be the best. MDF works really good or a board uh, that's covered in canvas works too if you choose to actually cover a canvas board. Um, so your clay is going to come, you, you have some pug, some of you already picked that up if we had some available. Also, uh, the purchase stuff, it comes in these square blocks uh, depending on where you get it. Um, so if you have leftover clay, you're going to need to learn how to wedge and that's a whole different technique that I can go over. So let me know about that. Uh, but with this, it's already de-aired, and it's something that you can beat out first. That's kind of like, you can make a slab by just patty caking things. You can anvil it. You can actually use the rolling pin to do this process. You can choose the weight of the rolling pin. But if you do it too long in one place, no matter what board you have, depending on the wetness of the clay, it could start sticking. Maybe you see this is a little wetter. Uh, so you can just move it to another surface, okay? You can just move it to this other surface, and then it won't stick. As you start to roll it out, that's important to keep in mind, too, because as I roll it out, I'm going to be putting pressure on it, too. Pressure this way and that way, and I'll further reiterate that when you see the rolling pin. So once I get it down close, maybe half of what I want, by kind of smacking it down with my hand, then I can... Um, start using a rolling pin. I could use a rolling pin right away, but it seems like a lot of work. So I'm, see how I'm rolling it? I'm gonna make it more even if I roll one way, then I roll the other way. So I want an even slab. Another way to get even slabs, if, if you get sticks, you can put sticks on both sides of that slab, and you can roll that rolling pin over it, and then move it again, move those sticks like this, and then roll it, and you see how the, the rolling pin is going to hang up on the stick, so it's not going to get any thinner than the stick. So you can get a specific thickness and an even thickness to your slabs by using sticks that are a certain thickness, and then you would get a slab like that. That's about a quarter inch. What I'm going to ask primarily is a little more than a quarter inch, and a quarter inch is about a pencil, and that's a good starting point for most of the projects you'll be working on. So... If I just roll one way, what's going to happen is it's going to get too thin in one area. That's why I'm saying you got to roll both ways. If I roll over it two or three times, one way, two or three times the other way, and then I pick it up and then move it, that's going to allow me to have the slab kind of not be stuck to the board also. It also allows the slab to grow. And now, if I cut this slab, even though I didn't use the sticks, if I'm really careful about going back and forth like that, it's going to be pretty even. If I want really tight, really even thickness on the whole slab, I might want to go, again, to using some kind of slats that the rolling pin hangs up for. Okay? I'm going to talk about some loose slab techniques using a male uh, mold. So a positive shape of some sort um, that you can use as a form that you would be rolling or laying the uh, clay over. So with this loose slab um, technique, you do need to resist the object that you're going to use. It could be round, it could be square. These are just some everyday common ones. Uh, when you put the paper on, a uh, newspaper or some kind of paper that's not real glossy, um, that's going to stick to the clay. So this paper being just regular old newspaper, it's going to absorb the water from the clay and peel off the clay on the interior of the form very easily. So I'm going to put it on there and we'll put a small piece of tape in an area. And the most important part here is that 
it slides um, on and off the form. So when you wrap that form, whatever that form may be with paper, you have to make sure that the paper's not really tight on there. So it needs to slide off. So this hard object, again, could be a four by four or it could be some found object, uh, even a bottle, a glass bottle, um, plastic objects, rectangular, square, uh, or round. But the, the one major issue is that that form has to have some kind of way that it will slide off of there. So if it does something where it undulates, that's, this is not going to be a technique you would use for that. You know, if you have a longer tube, it doesn't have to just be one piece. So this is from this real small tube. Um, and so I measured five inches up here and I marked the line. And now I'm just going to cut it through, slowly spinning it here on the turntable until it cuts clean through everywhere. Okay, so now instead of one piece, I have two pieces out of that same process. Of course, you could do a really long um, piece of PVC tubing and get a hardware store and do like six cups at, at the same time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dart these. I'm going to start out by actually starting where the seam is. But before I do that, I'm going to finish the lip and put a bottom on them. Okay, I'm finishing the lip by kind of throwing it a little, smoothing it out, rounding it up a little so it's not that cut shape. And I'm also going to get in there and just rib that interior too. Okay, I'm going to cut this bottom off here. Pretty much apply the slab by scoring slipping and using just a little bit of pressure. But I like to go back after I cut it off make sure we got it pretty well joined up. Just sometimes I can flip it over and just paddle the bottom slightly. And then I might put it like on a turntable here and use a stiff brush down in the bottom, kind of again like the way my finger would act. And now I'll get to the darting part. Now, since I know where the seam is here, I'm going to take this area and I'm going to cut just below where I might put a handle. Kind of a leaf shape out of there. Of course, the the size of the shape and the different shapes that you can possibly choose are going to dictate where the clay is going to move to after you remove it. Alright, so after I remove it, I can take that area, score it, slip it, and I like to kind of score and slip at the same time, sort of, so I'm dipping my scoring tool in that water slurry and then just pushing it coercing it together like this and I like to get that seam so it's more closed on the interior than on the exterior because I can fix the exterior easier. So I'm looking at the interior area. Okay, well, that just that one dart has given this form quite a different appearance and movement um, than just a straightforward cylinder. When we look into the interior, I've worked that seam working that seam especially down in the bottom and along that joint is really important to keep that piece together. Get further alteration, I'm going to reach in there and kind of give it a belly the opposite direction of where it's going right now. So I'm just reaching in here and I'm just pushing out um, trying to 
get that belly to come out. And I'm using this, this hard, um, large rib and reach down in there. Let's see what I got. Getting some kind of form change and just a subtle change in form is enough. Now I'm thinking about um, how a handle may jump off of here and come back down. Okay, I finished off these two cups from that one cylinder. Squared off the tops a little. Do some surface work on them and they'll be finished. And you see these with some slip work on them here. These will go into a wood kiln or a soda kiln. But also, um, sometimes I'll do glaze work. So these are reduction. And you can do it on much larger forms. And here's a larger tube that I'm rolling it on. You can see how it's easier on a larger one to roll it like this. Just have just a right, about maybe a quarter inch extra overlap there, which is going to give me a little thickness in that seam area. I can do some reductive work to get rid of it. But as you see, this pressure, my hand on the inside of the tube, against the two edges of this slab, this is where it's going to join it together. That pressure alone sometimes is just enough. So I've got it on pretty much affixed from the top to the bottom here. And I'm going to push down and roll. Okay, the seam's pretty fixed. I paddled it slightly. I'm going to paddle it a little more. Um, Sometimes I paddle it towards itself, and this is only if it's really right on. If it overlaps a lot, I don't worry about it, and I just do some reductive. And now, fixing this surface, I'm going to roll it off the canvas and get it onto a smooth surface. Instead of it being in this tube, I can get my arm in there. I can just lift it up and put it anywhere I want. So there is a benefit to having a hole in the tube sometimes, and you can think about that when you're choosing your form and work. The tools I like to use to work that surface, try and get this texture off of here. Um, these flexible rubber or plastic ribs. I like um, a flexible metal rib for bigger ones, and this could be as a straight edge on square objects too. Um, this little one that comes in all the cheesy uh, kits that you get, works really well too. So I'll use this. Everybody has that. And I like to moisten it slightly. I don't want it to drag and pull up too much clay. I also don't really want to change the shape too much. And I'm getting this surface off just by sledding, say it's sledding across the surface. So sliding it across the surface on an angle. I'm not going to use it upright like this to go it'll gouge into it. And this is compressing all that canvas texture off of there. Now another thing to think about is if you did clean this surface up you could then take it and roll it onto a composition that you've created out of different materials and it would then emboss that composition on the surface of this while it's still in the tube you can press against it. Got it all smoothed out. now. This is when it comes kind of a question of wetness and clay and girth or size of the piece before I flip it up. Because down here, if this is the bottom, or this could eventually be the top too, you could start on the top right away, like seal it off if you wanted to make an enclosed form. But it can sag down there as soon as I take the form out. So I'm going to gently get it on that angle, and then I'm going to slowly put it up there and allow that to slide down. It actually just got resisted from the paper and is not even attached to the tube. Now, this is where it comes into questions that you, I need to think about. Like if I'm going to keep it round, for instance, uh, I might just take the tube out of the paper as to not to disturb the clay. It's sliding out and I've got it out. And uh, the paper, most of it came out with it. Quite often it gets hung up in there. And if you take it out now and you want to keep the integrity of that circle, you could disturb it. If you want to get it out right away, you can put your finger in there, grab a piece of it, and twist it. Don't just pull it straight out, because it might be hung up somewhere. So I got that out. Then I'm going to look at the seam and look at the integrity of that seam. And I may, although I fixed it on the outside, 
I want to fix it in on the inside sometimes too. So let me show you the overlap of that seam. If you look down in there, the seam got fixed really well up here. And down there, there's a bit of an overlap that I'm going to have to smear in towards the other side. Okay, I've worked that seam fairly well, smoothed it out. And I also went in the whole circumference of the tube and used a soft, flexible rib and smoothed out any little dents that the paper may have bunched up and put a dent in there. Now, the options here are thinking about, again, keeping it in a cylindrical, real straightforward form or manipulating that form. If I'm going to manipulate the form, stretching it outward or maybe pushing it inward might be a problem too, but at least stretching it outward, I am going to think about that seam. So, although I've made it go away, I did make a mark there so I know where it is. I'm going to keep that mark in mind when I'm manipulating it. I can put it into a square right now or any kind of shape basically but I'm going to probably just show you a couple ways to um, push in, push out, play with the form. You can also um, cut away areas of the form and then squeeze it back together. A technique called darting and sewing is something to look into if you're interested. A little better example of pushing and pulling again on a cylindrical form but then doing some addition work uh, utilizing hand -built, other hand building techniques to work in form on the surface of, of the piece. Easiest way is to work with slabs in some ways can be the hardest. Uh, just working free uh, without any molds, without any templates um, or templates with this combination of this technique is working really loose basically with a, a freshly um, rolled slab, pretty loose slab here, clean off the surface, have it all ready and well this is a straight edge so I'm using this as a tool and I can just draw this through and get the bottom of this. What I'm going to do is just build a vertical form here do some basic cutting to alter it, um, darting like, I, like I'm, I've talked about, darting will be something that I'm going to use to alter it too, but basically making the form and then doing some reductive work to alter the form in a variety of ways, just to give you a few ideas. I have a sense of what kind of circumference I'm going to get from this distance, but I don't know exactly. And, you don't need to plan everything out exactly all the time. You can just go with the flow. And again, tools that are right next to you that have edges that you can use to try and get it close, that's giving me some kind of starting point. Again, I'm going to save these pieces for additive work on, again, the bottom, the top, or, or other things I might do here. So just, it's a loose slab, picking it up pretty gently and then giving it a curve. I can think about this curve as far as maybe that's where I'm going to stop, right there. Or maybe I'm going to pull it all the way around and attach it. Having some foresight and planning, of course, is always the best, I think. But you see the variety of things that can happen as you start thinking about it. Where it's going to go from here is going to be up to me. I can have a, a large open form that then I'm going to add a slab in between here or I can have this come in and close up on itself. So since it's wet clay I'm just going to pinch that edge together and I can certainly go back on the interior I can add a coil to that I'm just going to play with it that way right now. So I have this you know, basic shape that's going on here. You can see what's happening. It's got a curve. You see it from the bird's eye view. Again, this could be laid down. I'm going to cut an angle off here. So I'm using these. I'm trying to cut these out the same. And I'm going to give it about an inch and a half between each one. And after I cut these away, I can then close this in on itself. And I'll show you what I mean by it coming right onto the slab instead of overlapping or instead of coming point to point like that.
And obviously, what, what's happened, because I've taken that material away, is I've made this opening smaller now, and it's closing in on itself. So I'm going to work these seams, I'm working rather quickly here, using the clay at its, at its wet, wet stage, or looser, looser stage. Certainly, you can't do this at a leather hard stage. I'm going to turn it, work on this side now. Okay, you're seeing that bird's eye view again and seeing what's happening with these angles as I'm, I'm just smoothing them out with a fettling knife. I have yet to put any coils in there or close that um, area up with a slab on the bottom. What I have here now is this, this form that if I'm thinking about how these cuts have created those, those kind of facets here, I can also round those out. I can paddle them out. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I, I like these facets, they're working with the form. I'm thinking about getting in and doing some pushing out from the inside here to shape this a little. And I'm thinking about how I'm going to maybe cut away some of this and maybe add a slab. Still thinking about this possibly being the bottom of the piece too. I'm going to score this right now, um, get it, get it kind of wet because it's drying out the edges. I'm working really quick here, straight from the slab. I'm going to get in here and fill these areas in with coils, fix those seams up really well because getting at them right now is a lot easier than putting my arm in from this side. And then I'm going to flip it over and start working on the top. Got this bottom on there, I've scored and slipped it. I'm paddling to get that pressure, not too hard because again, it's pretty wet clay. And I'm paddling around, paddling around. And then I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to cut around and cut this excess off. Again, you think about that excess as part of the piece too. If you possibly want to roll it up onto the piece to create a, a line that, that the clay itself, uh, this slab actually kind of folds over and creates this foot under there. I can think if I'm going to do this uh, separate piece off of here as a foot that maybe comes out, that maybe adds more stability than this smaller foot. So there's a variety of things to think about here. Okay, I've got this coil. I'm going to lay down in there. And with a, a brush, not really my finger, I've got a longer brush I can get down in there. I can lay that into this seam here. And I can push it where I want it with the brush, just like with my finger. And I'm going to work that seam and, and fix that seam and reinforce it, give it somewhat of a gusset in there. Uh, it's not that big of a coil. It's probably about the same diameter as this paintbrush here, so um, it's not going to change too much on the top when you look at it from the top. But it's important to fix your seams. Sometimes you can get away with just building and not having any problem with the cracking, but I like to have this added step here just for some security. Okay, yeah, I've worked it pretty well. I've got the seam in here. I, I'm going to finish up down here after it gets a little stiffer, but I've cut most of that off. I'm going to work that seam more. I've gone in with a pretty stiff paintbrush and worked that interior seam where it's joined. We have to do a little bit more in there. And now I'm thinking about how I'm going to be maybe cutting away some from here. I've got this real sharp point edge there and I've got this curve. It's still got that kind of shape, but there is a coil that's fixing this seam. I'm thinking about cutting away. I could cut all the way into here, cut down, cut over, add a slab that can play with that, or I can dart it. I'm gonna play with possibly a dart, feather, a feather shape or a leaf shape like that, but probably from here to there to create some kind of concavity in this form. Right now, I'm going to get in there with this flexible rib and start pushing out from the inside. I'm going to do it very slowly, a little at a time. Again, this slab is pretty much just freshly rolled. And as I stretch it, sometimes there's little surface cracks that form. And that depends on the quality of your slab. This clay um, it's stretching out slightly, and I'm going to get a either think about that texture as something that I like or I'm going to erase that texture later on. 
but you can see in the profile here how it's creating this curve down here. I'm thinking about maybe another curve right here. Um, so a small one here and a little smaller one here. I'm thinking about actually slumping a form that's going to fit on top of here so there's a curve on top. Maybe cut an opening, have a handle, and do a spout. I worked uh, a little protuberance here and one here. Again, I'm still going to cut in here some way, but first I want to do this for the top of it. And pressure with this dry sponge to get a form that I can use as the top of the piece. And I can connect this in a variety of manners and I'll demonstrate that once it stiffens up. But um, I'll lift that out and you see that I now have this form that can then be attached. I'll lay that aside. I'm going to work on cutting through here and doing some negative space work in here for the handle to come in and have this area visually balancing um, this area. Okay, you see this area I cut out already. I didn't want to pull it out quite yet. And I usually would, of course, work towards myself when I'm doing this. And it's quite sticky. Even though I cut it out, it's still wanting to stay in. Now, this is the area that I'm going to seal up. I can score and slip this, and I probably have a better joint there. But again, the clay is wet. I'm going to start working down here first. And I'm looking down on it from the inside here. I'm slowly working it and pinching it like that. I will add a coil on the inside again, even though I already had added a coil to this area. Now I'm going to add another one, because I just cut it away, but I'm going to reinforce now this joint. Okay, now you're seeing what's happening here with the, the back profile. I'll fix this area up a little more, and then I'll add this part to the top. Okay, so I've finished up really filling in coils where I need to. I've smoothed this out a lot. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to put this as a top form on top of this. Uh, but before I do that, I really want to be able to get this spout on. I made a spout form um, that's kind of a frowny face on the top there and a big smiley face there, like a tongue spout. I'm going to go over this again here by just saying, moisten my finger and round out that freshly cut edge because I don't want that sharp edge. I also have it tapered. It's a little thinner at, at the tip of the spout than it is back here where it's going to join to the piece. Um, I lay it up, lay it up, and maybe I even pinch this right now while it's still flat and get it gradated down to even a sharper spout right here. And I'm going to curl it up and I'm probably going to just leave this one open here. Okay, I've scored, cut out, and scored this area. I've also scored the spout here. I'm going to do it a little bit more to make sure there's some slurry on there. And I'm going to go back on here, make sure that it's wet, and then I'm going to attach it. Okay, I've got this spout attached here, and I have this part that has given me a line that's on the inside of this opening. I'm going to cut this side of that line about the thickness of the clay and I'm going to score and I'm going to slip both sides, this side and this top part, this rim, and I'm going to attach those forms. All the time using this wet rib to really get that area that I'm trying to get back to a wet stage, even though this is still pretty much not much more than 
15, 20 minutes past the time I rolled this original slab, I'm still having that edge drying out on me. And so I need to get it back to a wet stage. Now I have this opening under here, so I can't press too hard there, but I can kind of pinch upward against it. So I'm getting this on here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to work this seam all the way around with slight pressure down. Again, trying not to press too much as to collapse down on the foot because it's still pretty wet down here. So I'm able to gently Battle that seam. Okay, now I have this top on. I've worked that seam pretty well, and you can see how this is working from the bird's eye view. I've got a handle pulled, and I'm thinking about where the opening for this form is going to be to be able to fill it. Okay, I have this handle ready here, and like I said, that, that point, that teardrop shape there, that's something you've seen, and I think you have to think about how the handle's going to go on there, and I wouldn't just cut it straight. So I have to think about that shape, cut into the handle, so the handle wraps around it. I'm also going to take and think about the angle. I'm also going to take the knife on a certain angle when I cut this and if I cut under it it's going to drop down. If I cut on an angle this way it's going to actually spring off of the form. And so I want it to kind of spring off of the form. So I'm going to cut like this. for that reason. So you see what I mean by the angle there. So that's going to allow it to attach to the form this way and spring off of it. Okay, I'm dipping my rib in some slippy water and I've decided I'm going to place it below here so it springs up and then comes down to here. And so I'm going to score that area, get that wet. Again, this still is a pretty wet slab here. It's not really leather hard, so when I press into this slab, I'm going to have to be careful. So, which is one of the reasons why the handle needs to be of a wetter state, too. Can't really take a stiffer handle and attach it. I'm going to take the handle part. And I'm going to score that part, get that ready, even though the handle's plenty wet. And I'm going to apply some pressure towards the pitcher here. Okay, I've got the handle on here, and now I have to um, think about where this opening is. I still have to work it a little bit, but I have to treat this pretty carefully. I still haven't really worked the bottom too much, um, but I am going to work the bottom a little bit more. And I am going to think about this opening here and the shape I want to cut out of here. I'm going to use a X-Acto knife. So I'm going to use this exacto knife to cut it out. I'm going to plan it out by thinking about the distance from here to here in the opening. And I'm also thinking about how it's going to relate to the actual shape. I don't want to have it drop in there. I get to the end of it, gently lift it out, 
And then I do a little bit of fine tuning on that. So if I'm going to look at that and I'm going to play with that shape a little bit more. I'm also going to get in here underneath this form and just fix that seam slightly. I don't feel like I need to add a coil. I paddled it pretty well. But I'm going to get in here with my finger primarily and just work that seam. And I'm going to look under there and make sure that it's all sealed up and looking fairly finished. So my last step here is to work on the edges here. Like I said, I don't really enjoy a freshly cut edge. It uh, adds a sharpness that can chip and visually I don't like it either. So I'm going to play with that edge, round that edge out, and the piece will be ready for surface work relative to slips or glazes. I'll probably use slips on it. Okay, I'm just uh, using a damp sponge. Uh, I don't want to use a sponge on this or some grog in this clay. I, I wouldn't just like sit there and sponge edges, but just get them a little wet and then be able to use my finger. If I use a sponge, what it does is it just takes those fine particles away and leaves kind of a coarse edge. So just wetting it slightly so there's some lubrication for my fingers to manipulate those edges is one way that I play with getting rid of a freshly cut edge. Okay, what I've tried to do with this demonstration is to show you how you can utilize slabs fresh off the slab roller or off of your rolling pin in a way that is a lot different than using mold or using templates. Using templates with this technique also may help you visualize what a specific shape slab might do. Also, you can cut profiles off of the slab that are relevant to the template that you cut. And then it can actually dictate some of the shape that you get out of the slab. So a picture like this is not so easily clean. I can't get my hand down in there. Um, sometimes we sacrifice utility for aesthetic and this may be one of those cases. To picture after I've done some slip work to it. I'm working on the surface later through the firing process may add more or obscure some of this too. So. Here's a few more ideas to use slabs. One other variation on working with loose slabs, I like to call it the, the pie shape. Um, taking a, a very small piece of pie out of a circle, you can bend it up and make a conical form. And I'm going to demonstrate that. Uh, utilizing that along with uh, making tubes, making other forms just with a free slab work is a good way to play with forms that would go up and in or or have it go down and under. Finding an object that's already round is a good way to start out. Um, you can do this technique with other shapes too and I'll demonstrate what that looks like. But um, I'm going to use this old CD, cut around it. And then, as I said, I'm going to cut out a small piece of pie so if I was on a diet or something so I'm going to find the middle and to find the middle if you want to be really exact you can draw a line and try and dissect it and draw a line again and just kind of see if those pieces are of equal distance you could even measure it if you want but to find the actual center of this, that's one way if you want to be precise. And I'm going to just go ahead and put my mark and cut right on that mark. And I'm going to start out by cutting a little at a time. Uh, I know I can always cut a little way more if I don't get the cone shape I want. But just cutting out that small piece allows me to then bend this over and I'll, I would then join that seam if I was happy with that cone um, and 
that would be one way to think about it. It's a good way to make lids also, not just parts to the, the body of the piece, but also other parts. So, so I'm going to say I want it a little more drastic, and I don't want to cut a whole quarter out just yet, just so I can show you the difference. So cutting out a little bit more, and I may overlap that seam, is showing you that peak on that cone, if that's like a roof, the peak of the roof is getting steeper. I'm going to cut out just a sh little more shape. So I'm going to cut out the full quarter of that pie and show you what happens then. And this is almost like a martini uh, glass, looking at that kind of shape. It's almost getting to that point. The bigger the cone, of course, uh, would actually fit into the, the nice size martini glass. Um, and of course the thickness of the clay, I'd probably use it a lot thinner if I was just going to use this as the drinking part of the vessel. So I'm going to cut out just a little bit more, just to show you, just going past that quarter point, what happens then. So that's just another maybe eighth of the pie, and this is showing you that the steepness there of this cone. So pretty simple idea. Again, it goes back to paper templates and anything you could cut out of paper could send, then be translated into clay. So instead of just playing with the clay, if you wanted to repeat things over and over, you could think about maybe a paper template. Instead of using a CD, you could lay on a hard stock paper that might you know, be able to be used over and over again and you could repeat this same cone over and over again. Okay, so affixing that seam, I have the options of overlapping it and just actually showing that seam or overlapping it and smoothing in that area with some reductive work possibly. Um, I also have that option of bringing this, this joint together right where the slab is cut. And so that's what I'm going to demonstrate. I may have to add a coil a little bit, but if that's going to be an interior seam to something that I was going to drink out of, I might try and get it as close to possible without adding any change in thickness to the cone. And I don't really want to manipulate this too much, but I have to use some pressure after I've scored and slipped that area. I have to use some pressure, and it's going to manipulate it quite a bit, but I can fettle it down, I can work it down with my fingers, and um, smooth out that seam. I'm going to close it in on the inside like I did on the outside, and go back to that that one tool I like a lot is uh, the stiff brush, and it acts as an eraser down in like this point of the cone I can't get to, but of course my fingers are going to be much better to use in some ways, not using very much water at all and allowing them to be able to manipulate that clay and move that clay. Of course I can lay it against this table here and I can use the flatness of the table to also kind of remove this seam but further work the inside a little bit and try and have it flow there. That may not be a pro might not be a problem that you have. You might think about that seam as part of the line in the piece Okay, I've laid it on the table here, and I am going to work this seam now. Sometimes even rolling it might get that exterior seam to start to flatten out there. And I can work it further with a rib or my fettling knife. So there you have it, a real simple way to make a cone, and it can be done on virtually any scale that you can handle. And now I'm going to show you how to work with something that's not round and do a similar process. This is an Ishing tool. I'm going to use this to cut slabs. It's got a blade on both sides here. I can adjust it to the actual size of the slab I'm going to want 
and I can use it against a straight edge and get a pretty straight slab. So I'm thinking off of this cone to actually have a cylinder come off of there, maybe about three inches or so. Okay, I'm going to tighten that up. I'm going to use this straight edge now on the slab and draw this across. Could of course just kind of freehand it and just pull it, but I might zigzag too much. So this gives me that slab pretty instantly without having to measure it. So that's the benefit of using a tool like that. Now of course just making marks on the clay and measuring out a distance you can also do the same. This lip here and have this actually be the top of this cone off of the cone and have this cylinder come off of there and have this as the lip to this. I've got somewhat of an idea of the diameter I want by looking at the actual cone. So I'm going to have that by me and I'm going to take this and I'm going to roll it up. I have more clay than I need but I'm going to take it up and I'm just going to roll it up into about that diameter that I'm going to look for. Sometimes I can then hold it close to there and say I need a little tighter like that. See, it's getting closer and now I'm going to get a tool on the inside here cut against it on an angle so this angle here matches that angle there and I can fit that seam together okay this tool I have that's just just a stick basically a piece of wood but it's got a little bit of a curvature on it so this is just a way that I can go ahead and cut this angle through both of these slabs and have something to kind of push against without manipulating the slab too much more. So I'm not going to use that, I'm not going to use that, and when this now comes together that angle matches up pretty well. If you see that. Yeah, as I said about the diameter of the cone, it matches up really well with this. So now I'm going to score and get this kind of wet and then do the same to the seam, get this seam together and I'm going to flip this over, keeping this refined, ref, uh, finished lip um, on the other side. I'll be scoring down here, and I'll join this piece to that. Okay, refining the seam. There's the seam right now. What I've been doing here is I, I pushed it together from that side and from this side, and then I got in with this, again, a curved piece, and a, I used a fettling knife, and I worked that seam. I fettled it up, I fettled it down, and I also worked it horizontally. So I'm going to work it a little bit more, show you what I mean, on an angle, meaning I'm taking some of the clay from here with pressure, moving it this way, and then sometimes on an angle that way. This is one way to close up a seam that's tight like that. Using this on the inside, of course, I have something to press against. Working on the inside of the seam, I pretty much just drag this upward. And so now you see the interior of the seam there close to being finished. The lip is the most important focal point on this, and so I'll really work this lip a lot more. And so I'm going to work uh, that lip just with my fingers really damp. Um, not really wet, but damp fingers. And so. I'm going to maybe use a sponge a little, but I'm pretty much going to try and not use a sponge because I don't want any grog or heavier particles being brought to the lip where I'm going to put my lip against. So, Okay, so I'll finish that off, and one of the things I like to do is on the bottom is to actually take that area and spray uh, maybe a plastic bat down and then run it on that area so that area stays wet while I'm working on another part. So here you see what I mean by that. Uh, I have some water there. And you see how I can do that. It's another way to flatten an area out too. If you're ever trying to get the bottom of something uh, even, you can do that. Eventually that slurry it starts flattening it out. I did that with this part of the piece too, to actually do that, to flatten this area out more. 
but it's also keeping that area where I'm going to join to that moist until I'm ready to do that. Okay, a real simple way I'm thinking about making the stem by rolling um, the slab onto a dowel rod. Of course, with something this big in diameter, it could be actually a solid uh, coil of clay. However, the structure of a solid coil compared to this, the shrinkage, um, sometimes cause cracks where you're joining it to the piece. So I've rolled it up on there and I have this area here where it's now going to roll onto the existing clay here. I'm going to cut that to be just a little bit more than I need so it can overlap and then I can do some reductive work on that seam once I get that together. Now I can use the pressure of the dowel rod in there. I don't want to get the dowel rod stuck in there, so I want to make sure that it's sliding in and out of that tube while I'm doing that. One way to do it is to actually use water on it and make it really slippery on the interior of this, but I don't really want it to get wet. I want to try and use it right off the bat. So I'm just going to take a, a dry wooden dowel and just keep turning it. If it starts to stick, then I just turn it slightly and it usually breaks itself free. Okay, so now I have the dowel rod on the inside against that seam and I'm gonna push down on both ends of the dowel rod and try and use pressure from the inside of this tube to seal that seam up there. And I might sometimes get on top of it like this and take a small paddle and use some pretty strong pressure to get that seam together. When you're paddling the clay you're really manipulating those molecules and getting them tight onto one another. Alright, obviously I don't need this long of a length if I'm making a, a chalice or something. If I'm making some sculptural form with this, then uh, of course length is something that you play with maybe. Um, and so I'm just going to sled across it with this and slowly get that honed up. Again, making sure that that dowel rod is sliding all the time. Okay, just for an example, I'm thinking about how you have this straightforward tube. Pretty simple. You could leave it like that, or I found something that was in the shop here. Just cardboard. You can think about finding other things that have texture on them. And since there's a dowel rod in there, I can feasibly roll this onto here and pick up that texture. I can push against it, and I'm creating um, instant texture on the surface of this. So I'm going to play with that, roll across it a couple times, show you what that looks like. Of course, if you roll it on an angle, you're going to pull up some kind of linear quality that's going to somewhat spiral up that form too. Uh, since that's an area that's going to be held, um, some surface tactile qualities to that can be nice to play with. Okay, it's pretty easy to cut a uh, form off like this. If you lay your knife on there and slowly cut like that, it cuts it pretty even. If you wanted to use that technique on larger diameter uh, cylinders with the same technique, you could think about how that could be several different pieces. Uh, or smaller diameter pieces if you wanted to use it for a variety of things not just the stem of something you could feasibly just roll across it with your knife like that and that way I've, I've cut off these one two three units here um, 
and you can measure it out and do that and stuff but since you have this dowel rod on the inside it makes it um, pretty easy to cut against it all right the other thing that when you cut that way you get a pretty flat surface if you're careful you have then that piece being able to sit pretty firmly on a flat area you don't have to worry about having it higher over here and lower over there okay i have the form pretty much fixed up on the interior and the exterior and it's still upside down right now for me um, for this form but this possibly could be a way to make a jar you could cut off here make a flange on it or cut it on an angle or do a puzzle kind of lid have a floor on it and uh, call it a jar i'm going to go to this different step i've again made this part and that's going to go up here with this one i'm looking at this i've already these areas here and here are both scored and very moist ready to stick you even see that it left a lot of clay but that just mark that area so i really need to score really well here slip that up and i'm going to attach that form to that i just went back to that simple shape that cone shape and I've prepared that. I've actually made it a hollow object. So, of course, a hollow object is going to need a hole. So, I'm going to put the hole in, and that hole is going to transfer to there, which then I may choose to put a hole in the stem somewhere to allow the air out, or I may put a hole in the bottom of this, which I can then seal up later. And see how I finished that part, too. It's a hollow object. And again, I said there's this hole. I was going to either put it in here or here. That will be an area that will be glazed shut in the final firing. So goblets are certainly challenging to make. Proportions are something that you play with. Sometimes the height of this could be a shorter or even taller. The volume of this could be more. Um, playing with those elements is very much like working with teapots and all the elements of the teapot. All right, so all the wet slab techniques that I just demonstrated can be used for so many different ideas that you might have from utilitarian directions to sculptural directions. So now it's your time to have fun with it and just try it. Dive right in.